what was promised in the second book of the Institutes, on continual and unceasing perseverance in prayer, shall be, by the Lord's help, fulfilled by the conferences of this elder, whom we will now bring forward, namely, Abba Isaac. And when these have been propounded, I think that I shall have satisfied the commands of Pope Castor of blessed memory, and your wishes, O blessed Pope Leontios, and holy brother Heladios, and the length of the book in its earlier part may be excused, though, in spite of our endeavor not only to compress what had to be told into a brief discourse, but also to pass over very many points in silence, it has been extended to a greater length than we intended. For having commenced with a full discourse on various regulations, which we have thought it well to curtail for the sake of brevity, at the close the blessed Isaac spoke these words. The aim of every monk and the perfection of his heart tends to continual and unbroken perseverance in prayer, and, as far as it is allowed to human frailty, strives to acquire an immovable tranquility of mind and a perpetual purity, for the sake of which we seek unweariedly and constantly to practice all bodily labors as well as contrition of spirit. And there is between these two of a sort of reciprocal and inseparable union. For just as the crown of the building of all virtues is the perfection of prayer, so, unless everything has been united and compacted by this as its crown, it cannot possibly continue strong and stable. For lasting and continual calmness in heart, of which we are speaking, cannot be secured or consummated without them. So neither can those virtues which lay its foundations be fully gained without persistence in it. And so we shall not be able either to treat properly of the effect of prayer, or, in a rapid discourse, to penetrate to its main end, which is acquired by laboring at all virtues, unless, first of all, those things which for its sake must be either rejected or secured, are singly enumerated and discussed, and, as the parable in the gospel teaches, whatever concerns the building of that spiritual and most lofty tower, is reckoned up and carefully considered beforehand. But yet these things, when prepared, will be of no use, nor allow the lofty height of perfection to be properly paced upon them, unless a clearance of all faults be first undertaken, and the decayed and dead rubbish of the passions be dug up, and the strong foundations of simplicity and humility be laid on the solid and, so to speak, living soil of our breast, or rather, on that rock of the gospel. And by being built in this way, this tower of spiritual virtues will rise, and be able to stand unmoved, and be raised to the utmost heights of heaven, in full assurance of its stability." For if it rests on such foundations, even though heavy storms of passions break over it, though mighty torrents of persecutions beat against it like a battering ram, though a furious tempest of spiritual foes dash against it and attack it, yet not only will no ruin overtake it, but the onslaught will not injure it, even in the slightest degree. And therefore, in order that prayer may be offered up with that earnestness and purity with which it ought to be, we must by all means observe these rules. First, all anxiety about carnal things must be entirely got rid of. Next, we must leave no room for not merely the care, but even the recollection of any business affairs. And, in like manner, also, must lay aside all backbitings, vain and incessant chattering, and buffoonery. Anger above all, and disturbing moroseness, must be entirely destroyed, and the deadly taint of carnal lust and covetousness 
be torn up by the roots. And so when these and such like faults, which are also visible to the eyes of men, are entirely removed and cut off, and when such a purification and cleansing, as we spoke of, has first taken place, which is brought about by pure simplicity and innocence, then first there must be laid the second foundations of a deep humility, which may be able to support a tower that shall reach the sky. And next, the spiritual structure of the virtues must be built up upon them, and the soul kept free from all conversation and from roving thoughts, that thus it may by little and little begin to rise to the contemplation of God and to spiritual insight. For whatever our mind has been thinking of before the hour of prayer is sure to occur to us while we are praying through the activity of the memory. Wherefore, what we want to find ourselves like while we are praying, that we ought to prepare ourselves to be before the time of prayer. For the mind in prayer is formed by its previous condition, and when we are applying ourselves to prayer, the images of the same actions and words and thoughts will dance before our eyes and make us either angry, as in our previous condition, or gloomy, or recall our former lust and business, or make us shake with foolish laughter, which I am ashamed to speak of, at some silly joke, or smile at some action, or fly back to our previous conversation. And therefore, if we do not want anything to haunt us while we are praying, we should be careful before our prayer to exclude it from the shrine of our heart, that we may thus fulfill the Apostle's injunction, pray without ceasing, and, in every place lifting up holy hands without wrath or disputing. For otherwise we shall not be able to carry out that charge unless our mind, purified from all stains of sin and given over to virtue as to its natural good, feed on the continual contemplation of Almighty God. For the nature of the soul is not inaptly compared to a very fine feather or very light wing, which, if it had not been damaged or affected by being spoilt by any moisture falling on it from without, is borne aloft, almost naturally, to the heights of heaven, by the lightness of its nature, and the aid of the slightest breath. But if it is weighted by any moisture, falling upon it, and penetrating into it, it will not only not be carried away by its natural lightness into any aerial flights, but will actually be borne down to the depths of earth by the weight of the moisture it has received. So also our soul, if it is not weighted with faults that touch it, and the cares of this world, or damaged by the moisture of injurious lusts, will be raised, as it were, by the natural blessing of its own purity, and borne aloft to the heights by the light breath of spiritual meditation, and leaving things low and earthly, will be transported to those that are heavenly and invisible." Wherefore we are well warned by the Lord's command, Take heed that your hearts be not weighed down by surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this world. And therefore, if we want our prayers to reach not only the sky, but what is beyond the sky, let us be careful to reduce our soul, purged from all earthly faults and purified from every stain, to its natural lightness, so that our prayer may rise to God unchecked by the weight of any sin. But we should notice the ways in which the Lord points out that the soul is weighed down, for he did not mention adultery, or fornication, or murder, or blasphemy, or rapine, which everybody knows to be deadly and damnable, but surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares or anxieties of this world which men of this world are so far from avoiding or considering damnable that actually some who, 
I am ashamed to say, call themselves monks, entangle themselves in these very occupations as if they were harmless or useful. And though these three things, when literally given way to weigh down the soul and separate it from God and bear it down to things earthly, yet it is very easy to avoid them, especially for us who are separated by so great a distance from all converse with this world and who do not on any occasion have anything to do with those visible cares and drunkenness and surfeiting. But there is another surfeiting which is no less dangerous, and a spiritual drunkenness which it is harder to avoid, and a care and anxiety of this world which often ensnares us even after the perfect renunciation of all our goods, and abstinence from wine, and all feastings, and even when we are living in solitude, and of such the prophet says, Awake, ye that are drunk, but not with wine. And another, Be astonished, and wonder, and stagger. Be drunk, and not with wine. Be moved, but not with drunkenness. And of this drunkenness, the wine must consequently be what the prophet calls the fury of dragons and from what root the wine comes you may hear. From the vine of Sodom, he says, is their vine, and their branches from Gomorrah. Would you also know about the fruit of that wine, and the seed of that branch? Their grape is a grape of gall, theirs is a cluster of bitterness. For unless we are altogether cleansed from all faults, and abstaining from the surfeit of all passions, our heart will, without drunkenness from wine and excess of any feasting, be weighed down by a drunkenness and surfeiting that is still more dangerous. For that worldly cares can sometimes fall on us who mix with no action of this world is clearly shown according to the rule of the elders, who have laid down that anything which goes beyond the necessities of daily food and the unavoidable needs of the flesh, belongs to worldly cares and anxieties, as, for example, if, when a job, bringing in a penny would satisfy the needs of our body, we try to extend it by a longer toil, and work in order to get two pence or three pence. And when a covering of two tunics would be enough for our use, both by night and day, we manage to become the owners of three or four. Or when a hut containing one or two cells would be sufficient, in the pride of worldly ambition and greatness, we build four or five cells, and these splendidly decorated, and larger than our needs required, thus showing the passion of worldly lusts whenever we can. And that this is not done without the prompting of devils, we are taught by the surest proofs. For when one very highly esteemed elder was passing by the cell of a certain brother who was suffering from this mental disease of which we have spoken, as he was restlessly toiling in his daily occupations in building and repairing what was unnecessary, he watched him from a distance, breaking a very hard stone with a heavy hammer, and saw a certain Ethiopian standing over him, and together with him striking the blows of the hammer with joined and clasped hands, and urging him on with fiery incitements to diligence in the work. And so he stood still for a long while, in astonishment at the force of the fierce demon, and the deceitfulness of such an illusion. For when the brother was worn out and tired, and wanted to rest, and put an end to his toil, he was stimulated by the Spirit's prompting, and urged on to resume his hammer again, and not to cease from devoting himself to the work which he had begun, so that being unweariedly supported by his incitements, he did not feel the harm that so great labor was doing him. At last, then, the old man, disgusted at such a horrid mystification by a demon, turned aside to the brother's cell, and saluted him, and asked, What work is it, brother, that you are doing? And he replied, We are working at this awfully hard stone, 
and we can hardly break it at all. Whereupon the elder replied, You were right in saying, We can, for you were not alone when you were striking it. But there was another with you whom you did not see, who was standing over you, not so much to help you, as urge you on with all his force. And thus the fact that the disease of worldly vanity has not got hold of our hearts will be proved by no mere abstinence from those affairs which even if we want to engage in, we cannot carry out, nor by the despising of those matters which, if we pursued them, would make us remarkable in the front rank among spiritual persons, as well as among worldly men but only when we reject with inflexible firmness of mind whatever ministers to our power and seems to be veiled in a show of right. And in reality, these things which seem trivial and of no consequence, and which we see to be permitted indifferently by those who belong to our calling, nonetheless by their character affect the soul than those more important things, which according to their condition usually intoxicate the senses of worldly people, and which do not allow a monk to lay aside earthly impurities and aspire to God, on whom his attention should be ever fixed. For in his case, even a slight separation from that highest good must be regarded as present death and most dangerous destruction. And when the soul has been established in such a peaceful condition, and has been freed from the meshes of all carnal desires, and the purpose of the heart has been steadfastly fixed on that which is the only highest good, he will then fulfill this apostolic precept, pray without ceasing, and, in every place lifting up holy hands without wrath and disputing. For when by this purity, if we can say so, the thoughts of the soul are engrossed, and are refashioned out of their earthly condition to bear a spiritual and angelic likeness, whatever it receives, whatever it takes in hand, whatever it does, the prayer will be perfectly pure and sincere. Germanus, if only we could keep as a lasting possession those spiritual thoughts in the same way and with the same ease with which we generally conceive their germs. For when they have been conceived in our hearts, either through the recollection of the scriptures, or by the memory of some spiritual actions, or by gazing upon heavenly mysteries, they vanish all too soon, and disappear by a sort of unnoticed flight. And when our soul has discovered some other occasions for spiritual emotions, different ones again crowd in upon us, and those which we had grasped are scattered, and lightly fly away, so that the mind, retaining no persistency, and keeping of its own power no firm hand over holy thoughts, must be thought, even when it does seem to retain them for a while, to have conceived them at random, and not of set purpose. For how can we think that their rise should be ascribed to our own will, if they do not last and remain with us? But that we may not, owing to the consideration of this question, wander any further from the plan of the discourse we had commenced, or delay any longer the explanation promised of the nature of prayer, we will keep this for its own time, and ask to be informed at once of the character of prayer, especially as the blessed apostle exhorts us at no time to cease from it, saying, Pray without ceasing. And so we want to be taught first of its character, that is, how prayer ought always to be offered up, and then how we can secure this, whatever it is, and practice it without ceasing. For that it cannot be done by any light purpose of heart, both daily experience and the explanation of your holiness show us, as you have laid it down that the aim of a monk and the height of all perfection consist in the consummation of prayer. Isaac I imagine that all kinds of prayers cannot be grasped without great purity of heart and soul, and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. 
For there are as many of them as there can be conditions and characters produced in one soul, or rather in all souls. And so, although we know that owing to our dullness of heart, we cannot see all kinds of prayers, yet we will try to relate them in some order, as far as our slender experience enables us to succeed. For according to the degree of the purity to which each soul attains, and the character of the state in which it is sunk owing to what happens to it, or is by its own efforts renewing itself, its very prayers will each moment be altered, and therefore it is quite clear that no one can always offer up uniform prayers. For everyone prays in one way when he is brisk, in another way when he is oppressed with a weight of sadness or despair, in another when he is invigorated by spiritual achievements, in another when cast down by the burdens of attacks, in another when he is asking pardon for his sins, in another when he asks to obtain grace or some virtue or else prays for the destruction of some sin, in another when he is pricked to the heart by the thought of hell and the fear of future judgment, in another when he is aglow with the hope and desire of good things to come, in another when he is taken up with affairs and dangers, in another when he is in peace and security, in another when he is enlightened by the revelation of heavenly mysteries, and in another when he is depressed by a sense of barrenness in virtues and dryness in feeling. And therefore, when we have laid this down with regard to the character of prayer, although not so fully as the importance of the subject requires, but as fully as the exigencies of time permit, and at any rate as our slender abilities admit, and our dullness of heart enables us, a still greater difficulty now awaits us, namely, to expound one by one the different kinds of prayer, which the Apostle divides in a fourfold manner, when he says as follows, I exhort therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made. And we cannot possibly doubt that this division was not idly made by the Apostle. And to begin with, we must investigate what is meant by supplication, by prayer, by intercession, and by thanksgiving. Next we must inquire whether these four kinds are to be taken in hand by him who prays all at once. That is, are they all to be joined together in every prayer, or whether they are to be offered up in turns and one by one, as, for instance, ought at one time supplications, at another prayers, at another intercessions, and at another thanksgivings to be offered. Or should one man present to God supplications, another prayers, another intercessions, another thanksgivings, in accordance with that measure of age to which each soul is advancing by earnestness of purpose? And so to begin with, we must consider the actual force of the names and words, and discuss what is the difference between prayer and supplication and intercession. Then in like manner we must investigate whether they are to be offered separately or all together. And in the third place we must examine whether the particular order which is thus arranged by the Apostle's authority has anything further to teach the hearer, or whether the distinction simply is to be taken, and it should be considered that they were arranged by him indifferently in such a way a thing which seems to me utterly absurd. For one must not believe that the Holy Spirit uttered anything casually or without reason through the Apostle. And so we will, as the Lord grants us, consider them in the same order in which we began. I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications be made. Supplication is an imploring or petition concerning sins, in which one who is sorry for his present 
or past deeds, asks for pardon. Prayers are those by which we offer or vow something to God, what the Greeks call iki, that is, a vow. In Latin we read, I will pay my vows unto the Lord, where according to the exact force of the words, it may be thus represented, I will pay my prayers unto the Lord. And this which we find in Ecclesiastes, If thou vowest a vow unto the Lord, do not delay to pay it, is written in Greek likewise, If thou prayest a prayer unto the Lord, do not delay to pay it, which will be fulfilled in this way by each one of us. We pray when we renounce this world and promise that being dead to all worldly actions and the life of this world, we will serve the Lord with full purpose of heart. We pray when we promise that despising secular honors and scorning earthly riches, we will cleave to the Lord in all sorrow of heart and humility of spirit. We pray when we promise that we will ever maintain the most perfect purity of body and steadfast patience, or when we vow that we will utterly root out of our heart the roots of anger or of sorrow that worketh death. And if, enervated by sloth and returning to our former sins, we fail to do this, we shall be guilty as regards our prayers and vows, and these words will apply to us. It is better not to vow, than to vow and not to pay, which can be rendered in accordance with the Greek. It is better for thee not to pray, than to pray and not to pay. In the third place stand intercessions which we are wont to offer up for others also, while we are filled with fervor of spirit, making request either for those dear to us or for the peace of the whole world, and to use the Apostle's own phrase, we pray, for all men, for kings, and all that are in authority. Then in the fourth place there stands thanksgivings, which the mind, in ineffable transports, offers up to God, either when it recalls God's past benefits, or when it contemplates his present ones, or when it looks forward to those great ones in the future which God has prepared for them that love him. And with this purpose too, sometimes we are wont to pour forth richer prayers, while as we gaze with pure eyes on those rewards of the saints which are laid up in store hereafter, our spirit is stimulated to offer up unspeakable thanks to God with boundless joy. And of these four kinds, although sometimes occasions arise for richer and fuller prayers, for from the class of supplications which arises from sorrow for sin, and from the kind of prayer which flows from confidence in our offerings, and the performance of our vows in accordance with a pure conscience, and from the intercession which proceeds from fervor of love, and from the thanksgiving which is born of the consideration of God's blessings and his greatness and goodness, we know that oftentimes there proceed most fervent and ardent prayers, so that it is clear that all these kinds of prayer which we have spoken of are found to be useful and needful for all men, so that in one and the same man his changing feelings will give utterance to pure and fervent petitions now of supplications, now of prayers, now of intercessions. Yet the first seems to belong more especially to beginners, who are still troubled by the stings and recollections of their sins. The second to those who have already attained some loftiness of mind in their spiritual progress and the quest of virtue. The third to those who fulfill the completion of their vows by their works, and are so stimulated to intercede for others also through the consideration of their weakness and the earnestness of their love. The fourth, to those who have already torn from their hearts the guilty thorns of conscience, and thus, being now free from care, can contemplate with a pure mind the beneficence of God and his compassions, which he has either granted in the past or is giving in the present, or preparing for the future and thus are borne onward with fervent hearts to that ardent prayer which cannot be embraced or expressed by the mouth of men.
Sometimes, however, the mind, which is advancing to that perfect state of purity, and which is already beginning to be established in it, will take in all these at one and the same time, and, like some incomprehensible and all-devouring flame, dart through them all, and offer up to God inexpressible prayers of the purest force, which the Spirit itself, intervening with groanings that cannot be uttered, while we ourselves understand not, pours forth to God, grasping at that hour, and ineffably pouring forth in its supplications things so great that they cannot be uttered with the mouth, nor even at any other time be recollected by the mind. And thence it comes that, in whatever degree any one stands, he is found sometimes to offer up pure and devout prayers, as even in that first and lowly station which has to do with the recollection of future judgment, he who still remains under the punishment of terror and the fear of judgment is so smitten with sorrow for the time being that he is filled with no less keenness of spirit from the richness of his supplications than he who through the purity of his heart gazes on and considers the blessings of God and is overcome with ineffable joy and delight. For as the Lord himself says, he begins to love the more, who knows that he has been forgiven the more. Yet we ought, by advancing in life and attaining to virtue, to aim rather to those kinds of prayer which are poured forth either from the contemplation of the good things to come, or from fervor of love, or which at least, to speak more humbling, and, accordance with the measure of beginners, arise for the acquirement of some virtue, or the extinction of some fault. For otherwise we shall not possibly attain to those sublimer kinds of supplication of which we spoke, unless our mind has been little by little, and by degrees, raised through the regular course of those intercessions. These four kinds of supplication the Lord himself, by his own example, vouchsafed to originate for us, so that in this too he might fulfill that which was said of him, which Jesus began both to do and to teach. For he made use of the class of supplication when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, or this which is chanted in his person in the psalm. My God, my God, look upon me, why hast thou forsaken me? And others like it. It is prayer where he says, I have magnified thee upon the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and this. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. It is intercession when he says, Father, those whom thou hast given me, I will that they also may be with me, that they may see my glory which thou hast given me. Or, at any rate, when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is thanksgiving when he says, I confess to thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Or at least when he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, but I knew that thou hearest me always. But though our Lord made a distinction between these four kinds of prayers as to be offered separately and one by one according to the scheme which ye know of, yet that they can all be embraced in a perfect prayer at one and the same time, he showed by his own example in that prayer which at the close of St. John's Gospel we read that he offered up with such fullness, from the words of which, as it is too long to repeat all, the careful inquirer can discover by the order of the passage that this is so. And the apostle also in his epistle to the Philippians has expressed the same meaning by putting these four kinds of prayer in a slightly different order and has shown that they ought sometimes to be offered together in the fervor of a single prayer, saying as follows, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And by this he wanted us especially to understand 
that in prayer and supplication thanksgiving ought to be mingled with our requests. And so there follows after these different kinds of supplication a still more sublime and exalted condition which is brought about by the contemplation of God alone and by fervent love, by which the mind, transporting and flinging itself into love for him, addresses God most familiarly as its own father with a piety of its own. And that we ought earnestly to seek after this condition, the formula of the Lord's Prayer teaches us, saying, Our Father. When then we confess with our own mouths that the God and Lord of the universe is our Father, we profess forthwith that we have been called from our condition as slaves to the adoption of sons, adding next, which art in heaven, that by shunning with the utmost horror all lingering in this present life, which we pass upon this earth as a pilgrimage, and what separates us by a great distance from our Father, we may the rather hasten with all eagerness to that country where we confess that our Father dwells, and may not allow any of this kind, which would make us unworthy of this our profession and the dignity of an adoption of this kind, and so deprive us as a disgrace of our Father's inheritance, and make us incur the wrath of his justice and severity, to which state and condition of sonship, when we have advanced, we shall forthwith be inflamed with the piety which belongs to good sons, so that we shall bend all our energies to the advance not of our own profit, but of our Father's glory, saying to him, Hallowed be thy name, testifying that our desire and our joy is his glory, becoming imitators of him who said, He who speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of him who sent him, the same is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Finally, the chosen vessel, being filled with this feeling, wished that he could be anathema for Christ, if only the people belonging to him might be increased and multiplied, and the salvation of the whole nation of Israel accrue to the glory of his Father. For with all assurance could he wish to die for Christ, as he knew that no one perished for life. And again he says, We rejoice when we are weak, but ye are strong. And what wonder if the chosen vessel wished to be anathema from Christ, for the sake of Christ's glory and the conversion of his own brethren, and the privilege of the nation, when the prophet Micah wished that he might be a liar and a stranger to the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, if only the people of the Jews might escape those plagues and the going forth into captivity which he had announced in his prophecy, saying, Would that I were not a man that hath the Spirit, and that I rather spoke a lie, to pass over that wish of the lawgiver, who did not refuse to die together with his brethren who were doomed to death, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, this people hath sinned a heinous sin. Either forgive them this trespass, or if thou do not, blot me out of thy book which thou hast written. But where it is said, Hallowed be thy name, it may also be very fairly taken in this way. The hallowing of God is our perfection. And so when we say to him, Hallowed be thy name, we say in other words, Make us, O Father, such that we may be able both to understand and take in what the hallowing of thee is, or at any rate that thou mayest be seen to be hallowed in our spiritual converse. And this is effectually fulfilled in our case when men see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. The second petition of the pure heart desires that the kingdom of its Father may come at once, namely, either that whereby Christ reigns day by day in the saints, which comes to pass when the devil's rule is cast out of our hearts by the destruction of foul sins, and God begins to hold sway over us by the sweet odor of virtues, and fornication being overcome, charity reigns in our hearts together with tranquility when rage is conquered, and humility 
when pride is trampled underfoot, or else that which is promised in due time to all who are perfect, and to all the sons of God, when it will be said to them by Christ, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. As the heart, with fixed and steadfast gaze, so to speak, yearns and longs for it, and says to him, Thy kingdom come. For it knows, by the witness of its own conscience, that when he shall appear, it will presently share his lot. For no guilty person would dare either to say or to wish for this, for no one would want to face the tribunal of the judge, who knew that at his coming he would forthwith receive not the prize or reward of his merits, but only punishment. The third petition is that of sons. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. There can now be no grander prayer than to wish that earthly things may be made equal with things heavenly. For what else is it to say, Thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth, than to ask that men may be like angels, and that as God's will is ever fulfilled by them in heaven, so also all those who are on earth may do not their own, but his will. This too no one could say from the heart, but only one who believed that God disposes for our good all things which are seen, whether fortunate or unfortunate, and that he is more careful and provident for our good and salvation than we ourselves are for ourselves. Or at any rate, it may be taken in this way, the will of God is the salvation of all men, according to these words of the blessed Paul, who willeth all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth, of which will also the prophet Isaiah says in the person of God the Father, and all thy will shall be done. When he says then, thy will be done as in heaven so on earth, we pray in other words for this, namely, that as those who are in heaven so also may all those who dwell on earth be saved, O Father, by the knowledge of thee. Next, give us this day our bread, which is epiosios, that is, supersubstantial, which another evangelist calls daily. The former indicates the quality of its nobility and substance, in virtue of which it is above all substances, and the loftiness of its grandeur and holiness exceeds all creatures, while the latter intimates the purpose of its use and value. For where it says daily, it shows that without it we cannot live a spiritual life for a single day. Where it says today, it shows that it must be received daily, and that yesterday's supply of it is not enough, but that it must be given to us today also in like manner. And our daily need of it suggests to us that we ought at all times to offer up this prayer, because there is no day on which we have no need to strengthen the heart of our inner man by eating and receiving it, although the expression used, today, may be taken to apply to this present life. That is, while we are living in this world, supply us with this bread. For we know that it will be given to those who deserve it by thee hereafter, but we ask that thou wouldest grant it to us today, because unless it has been vouchsafed to a man to receive it in this life, he will never be partaker of it in that. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. O unspeakable mercy of God, which has not only given us a form of prayer and taught us a system of life acceptable to him, and by the requirements of the form given, in which he charged us always to pray, has torn up the roots of both anger and sorrow, but also gives to those who pray an opportunity and reveals to them a way by which they may move a merciful and kindly judgment of God to be pronounced over them, and which somehow gives us a power by which we can moderate the sentence of our judge, drawing him to forgive our offenses by the example of our forgiveness when we say to him, Forgive us as we also forgive. And so without anxiety, 
and in confidence from this prayer, a man may ask for pardon of his own offenses, if he has been forgiving towards his own debtors, and not towards those of his Lord. For some of us, which is very bad, are inclined to show ourselves calm and most merciful in regard to those things which are done to God's detriment, however great the crimes may be, but to be found most hard and exorable exactors of debts to ourselves even in the case of the most trifling wrongs. Whoever then does not from his heart forgive his brother who has offended him, by this prayer calls down upon himself not forgiveness, but condemnation, and by his own profession asks that he himself may be judged more severely, saying, Forgive me, as I also have forgiven. And if he is repaid according to his own request, what else will follow but that he will be punished after his own example with implacable wrath and a sentence that cannot be remitted? And so, if we want to be judged mercifully, we ought also to be merciful towards those who have sinned against us. For only so much will be remitted to us as we have remitted to those who have injured us, however spitefully. And some dreading this, when this prayer is chanted by all the people in church, silently omit this clause, for fear lest they may seem by their own utterance to bind themselves rather than to excuse themselves, as they do not understand that it is vain that they try to offer these quibbles to the judge of all men, who has willed to show us beforehand how he will judge his suppliants. For as he does not wish to be found harsh and inexorable towards them, he has marked out the manner of his judgment, that just as we desire to be judged by him, so we should also judge our brethren, if they have wronged us in anything. For he shall have judgment without mercy, who hath shown no mercy. Next there follows, And lead us not into temptation on which there arises no unimportant question. For if we pray that we may not be suffered to be tempted, how then will our power of endurance be proved? According to this text, everyone who is not tempted is not proved. And again, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. The clause then, lead us not into temptation, does not mean this, namely, do not permit us ever to be tempted. But do not permit us, when we fall into temptation, to be overcome. For Job was tempted, but was not led into temptation. For he did not ascribe folly to God, nor blasphemy, nor with impious mouth did he yield to that wish of the tempter toward which he was drawn. Abraham was tempted, Joseph was tempted, but neither of them was led into temptation, for neither of them yielded his consent to the tempter. Next there follows, But deliver us from evil. That is, do not suffer us to be tempted by the devil, above that we are able. But make with the temptation a way also of escape, that we may be able to bear it. You see then, what is the method and form of prayer proposed to us by the judge himself? who is to be prayed to by it, a form in which there is contained no petition for riches, no thought of honors, no request for power and might, no mention of bodily health and of temporal life. For he who is the author of eternity would have men ask of him nothing uncertain, nothing paltry, and nothing temporal. And so a man will offer the greatest insult to his majesty and bounty if he leaves on one side these eternal petitions and chooses rather to ask of him something transitory and uncertain, and will also incur the indignation rather than the propitiation of the judge by the pettiness of his prayer. This prayer, then, though it seems to contain all the fullness of perfection, as being what was originated and appointed by the Lord's own authority, yet lifts those to whom it belongs to that still higher condition of which we spoke above, and carries them on by a loftier stage to that ardent prayer 
which is known and tried by but very few, and which, to speak more truly, is ineffable, which transcends all human thoughts, and is distinguished, I will not say, by any sound of the voice, but by no movement of the tongue, or utterance of the words, but which the mind enlightened by the infusion of that heavenly light, describes in no human and confined language, but pours forth richly, as from a copious fountain, in an accumulation of thoughts, and ineffably utters to God, expressing in the shortest possible space of time such great things that the mind, when it returns to its usual condition, cannot easily utter or relate. And this condition our Lord also similarly prefigured by the form of those supplications which, when he retired alone in the mountain, he is said to have poured forth in silence. And when being in an agony of prayer, he shed forth even drops of blood, as an example of a purpose which it is hard to imitate. But who is able, with whatever experience he may be endowed, to give a sufficient account of the varieties and reasons and grounds of conviction by which the mind is inflamed and set on fire and incited to pure and most fervent prayers? And of these we will now, by way of specimen, set forth a few, as far as we can by God's enlightenment recollect them. For sometimes a verse of any one of the Psalms gives us an occasion of ardent prayer while we are singing. Sometimes the harmonious modulation of a brother's voice stirs up the minds of dullards to intense supplication. We know also that the annunciation and the reverence of the chanter adds greatly to the fervor of those who stand by. Moreover, the exhortation of a perfect man and a spiritual conference has often raised the affections of those present to the richest prayer. We know, too, that by the death of a brother or someone dear to us, we are no less carried away to a full conviction. The recollection also of our coldness and carelessness has sometimes aroused in us a healthful fervor of spirit. And in this way, no one can doubt that numberless opportunities are not wanting, but which, through God's grace, the coldness and sleepiness of our minds can be shaken off. But how and in what way those very convictions are produced from the inmost recesses of the soul, it is no less difficult to trace out. For often, through some inexpressible delight and keenness of spirit, the fruit of a most salutary conviction arises so that it actually breaks forth into shouts, owing to the greatness of its incontrollable joy. And the delight of the heart and greatness of exultation makes itself heard even in the cell of a neighbor. But sometimes the mind hides itself in complete silence within the secrets of a profound quiet, so that the amazement of a sudden illumination chokes all sounds of words, and the overawed spirit either keeps all its feelings to itself or loses them and pours forth its desires to God with groanings that cannot be uttered. But sometimes it is filled with such overwhelming conviction and grief that it cannot express it except by floods of tears. Germanos My own poor self, indeed, is not altogether ignorant of this feeling of conviction, for often when tears arise at the recollection of my faults, I have been by the Lord's visitation so refreshed by this ineffable joy which you describe that the greatness of the joy has assured me that I ought not to despair of their forgiveness. Then which state of mind I think there is nothing more sublime if only it could be recalled at her own will. But sometimes when I am desirous to stir myself up with all my power to the same conviction and tears, and place before my eyes all my faults and sins, I am unable to bring back that copiousness of tears, and so my eyes are dry and hard like some hardest flint, so that not a single tear trickles from them, 
and so in proportion as I congratulate myself on that copiousness of tears, just so do I mourn that I cannot bring it back again whenever I wish. Isaac Not every kind of shedding of tears is produced by one feeling or one virtue. For in one way does that weeping originate, which is caused by the pricks of our sins, smiting our heart, of which we read, I have labored in my groanings. Every night I will wash my bed. I will water my couch with my tears. And again, let tears run down like a torrent day and night. Give thyself no rest, and let not the apple of thine eye cease. And another that which arises from the contemplation of eternal good things, and the desire of that future glory, owing to it even richer wellsprings of tears, burst forth from uncontrollable delights and boundless exultation, while our soul is athirst for the mighty living God, saying, When shall I come and appear before the presence of God? My tears have been my meat day and night, declaring with daily crying and lamentation, Woe is me, that my sojourning is prolonged, and too long hath my soul been a sojourner. In another way do the tears flow forth, which without any conscience of deadly sin, yet still proceed from the fear of hell and the recollection of that terrible judgment, with the terror of which the prophet was smitten and prayed to God, saying, Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. There is too another kind of tears, which are caused not by knowledge of one's self, but by the hardness and sins of others, whereby Samuel is described as having wept for Saul, and both the Lord in the Gospel and Jeremiah in former days for the city of Jerusalem, the latter thus saying, O oh, that my head were water and my eyes a fountain of tears! and I will weep day and night for the stain of the daughter of my people. Or also such as were those tears of which we hear in the hundred and first psalm. For I have eaten ashes for my bread, and mingled my cup with weeping. And these were certainly not caused by the same feeling as those which arise in the sixth psalm from the person of the penitent, but were due to the anxieties of this life and its distresses and losses by which the righteous who are living in this world are oppressed. And this is clearly shown not only by the words of the psalm itself, but also by its title, which runs as follows in the character of that poor person of whom it is said in the gospel, that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A prayer of the poor when he was in distress and poured forth his prayer to God. From these tears, those are vastly different which are squeezed out from dry eyes while the heart is hard. And although we cannot believe that these are altogether fruitless, for the attempt to shed them is made with a good intention, especially by those who have not yet been able to attain to perfect knowledge or to be thoroughly cleansed from the stains of past or present sins. Yet certainly the flow of tears ought not to be thus forced out by those who have already advanced to the love of virtue, nor should the weeping of the outward man be with great labor attempted, as even if it is produced, it will never attain the rich copiousness of spontaneous tears. For it will rather cast down the soul of the suppliant by his endeavors, and humiliate him, and plunge him in human affairs, and draw him away from the celestial heights, wherein the awed mind of one who prays should be steadfastly fixed, and will force it to relax its hold on its prayers, and grow sick from barren and forced tears. And that you may see the character of true prayer, I will give you not my own opinion, but that of the blessed Antony whom we have known sometimes to have been so persistent in prayer, that often as he was praying in a transport of mind, when the sunrise began to appear, we have heard him in the fervor of his spirit declaiming, Why do you hinder me, O son, who art arising for this very purpose, namely to withdraw me from the brightness of this true light? 
and his also is this heavenly and more than human utterance on the end of prayer. That is not, said he, a perfect prayer, wherein a monk understands himself and the words which he prays. And if we too, as far as our slender ability allows, may venture to add anything to this splendid utterance, we will bring forward the marks of prayer which are heard from the Lord as far as we have tried them. When, while we are praying, no hesitation intervenes and breaks down the confidence of our petition by a sort of despair, but we feel that by pouring forth our prayer we have obtained what we are asking for, we have no doubt that our prayers have effectually reached God, for so far will one be heard and obtain an answer, as he believes that he is regarded by God, and that God can grant it. For the saying of our Lord cannot be retracted, Whatsoever ye ask when ye pray, believe that you shall receive, and they shall come to you. Germanus We certainly believe that this confidence of being heard flows from purity of conscience, but for us, whose heart is still smitten by the pricks of sins, how can we have it, as we have no merits to plead for us, whereby we might confidently presume that our prayers would be heard? Isaac That there are different reasons for prayer being heard in accordance with the varied and changing condition of souls, the words of the Gospels and of the prophets teach us. For you have the fruits of an answer pointed out by the Lord's words in the case of the agreement of two persons, as it is said. If two of you shall agree upon earth, touching anything, for which they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. You have another in the fullness of faith, which is compared to a grain of mustard. For, he says, if you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible to you. You have it in the continuance in prayer, which the Lord's words call, by reason of unwearied perseverance in petitioning, importunity. For verily I say unto you, that if not because of his friendship, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. You have in it in the fruits of almsgiving. Shut up alms in the heart of the poor, and it shall pray for thee in the time of tribulation. You have it in the purifying of life and in works of mercy, as it is said, Loose the bands of wickedness unto the bundles that oppress, and after a few words in which the barrenness of an unfruitful fast is rebuked, then he says, Thou shalt call, and the Lord shall hear thee. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here am I. Sometimes also excess of trouble cause it to be heard, as it is said. When I was in trouble I called unto the Lord, and he heard me. And again, afflict not the stranger, for if he crieth unto me, I will hear him, for I am merciful. You see then in how many ways the gift of an answer may be obtained, so that no one need to be crushed by the despair of his conscience for securing those things which are solitary and eternal. For if in contemplating our wretchedness I admit that we are utterly destitute of all those virtues which we mentioned above, and that we have neither that laudable agreement of two persons, nor that faith which is compared to a grain of mustard seed, nor those works of piety which the prophet describes. Surely we cannot be without that importunity which he supplies to all who desire it, owing to which alone the Lord promises that he will give whatever he has been prayed to give. And therefore we ought without unbelieving hesitation to persevere, and not to have the least doubt that by continuing in them we shall obtain all those things which we have asked according to the mind of God. For the Lord, in his desire to grant what is heavenly and eternal, urges us to constrain him, as it were, by our importunity, 
as he not only does not despise or reject the importunate, but actually welcomes and praises them, and most graciously promises to grant whatever they have perseveringly hoped for, saying, Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And again, all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive, and nothing shall be impossible to you. And therefore, even if all the grounds for being heard which we have mentioned are altogether wanting, at any rate the earnestness of importunity may animate us, as this is placed in the power of any one who wills without the difficulties of any merits or labors. But let not any suppliant doubt that he certainly will not be heard, so long as he doubts whether he is heard. But that this also shall be sought from the Lord unweariedly, we are taught by the example of the blessed Daniel, as, though he was heard from the first day on which he began to pray, he only obtained the result of his petition after one and twenty days. Wherefore, we also ought not to grow slack in the earnestness of the prayers we have begun, if we fancy that the answer comes but slowly, for fear lest perhaps the gift of the answer be in God's providence delayed, or the angel, who was to bring the divine blessing to us, may, when he comes forth from the presence of the Almighty, be hindered by the resistance of the devil, as it is certain that he cannot transmit and bring to us the desired boon, if he finds that we slack off from the earnestness of the petition made. And this would certainly have happened to the above-mentioned prophet, unless he had with incomparable steadfastness prolonged and persevered in his prayers until the twenty-first day. Let us then not be at all cast down by despair from the confidence of this faith of ours, even when we fancy that we are far from having obtained what we prayed for, and let us not have any doubts about the Lord's promise where he says, All things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. For it is well for us to consider this saying of the blessed evangelist John, by which the ambiguity of this question is clearly solved. This is, he says, the confidence which we have in him, that whatsoever we ask according to his will, he heareth us. He bids us then have a full and undoubting confidence of the answer only in those things which are not for our own advantage or for temporal comforts, but are in conformity to the Lord's will. And we are also taught to put this into our prayers by the Lord's Prayer, where we say, Thy will be done, thine, not ours. For if we also remember these words of the Apostle, that we know not what we pray for as we ought, we shall see that we sometimes ask for things opposed to our salvation, and that we are most providentially refused our requests by him who sees what is good for us with greater right and truth than we can. And it is clear that this also happened to the teacher of the Gentiles when he prayed that the messenger of Satan, who had been for his good, allowed by the Lord's will to buffet him, might be removed, saying, For which I besought the Lord thrice, that he might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for strength is made perfect in weakness. And this feeling even our Lord expressed, when he prayed in the character of man which he had taken, that he might give us a form of prayer, as other things also by his example, saying thus, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Though certainly his will was not discordant with his father's will, for he had come to save what was lost, and to give his life a ransom for many. As he himself says, No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. In which character there is in the thirty-ninth psalm 
the following sung by the blessed David, of the unity of will which he ever maintained with the Father. To do thy will, O my God, I am willing. For even if we read of the Father, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, we find none the less of the Son, who gave himself for our sins. And as it is said of the one, who spared not his own Son, but gave him for all of us, so it is written of the other, he was offered because he himself willed it. And it is shown that the will of the Father and of the Son is in all things one, so that even in the actual mystery of the Lord's resurrection we are taught that there was no discord of operation. For just as the blessed apostle declares that the Father brought about the resurrection of his body, saying, And God the Father who raised him from the dead, so also the Son testifies that he himself will raise again the temple of his body, saying, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And therefore, we being instructed by all these examples of our Lord which have been enumerated, ought to end our supplications also with the same prayer, and always to subjoin this clause to all our petitions. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. But it is clear enough that one who does not pray with attention of mind cannot observe that threefold reverence which is usually practiced in the assemblies of the brethren at the close of service. Before all things, however, we ought most carefully to observe the evangelic precept, which tells us to enter into our chamber and shut the door and pray to our Father, which may be fulfilled by us as follows. We pray within our chamber, when removing our hearts inwardly from the din of all thoughts and anxieties, we disclose our prayers in secret and in closest intercourse to the Lord. We pray with closed doors, when with closed lips and complete silence we pray to the searcher, not of words, but of hearts. We pray in secret when from the heart and fervent mind we disclose our petitions to God alone, so that no hostile powers are even able to discover the character of our petition. Wherefore, we should pray in complete silence, not only to avoid distracting the brethren standing near by our prayers or louder utterances, and disturbing the thoughts of those who are praying, but also that purport of our petition may be concealed from our enemies, who are especially on the watch against us while we are praying. For so we shall fulfill this injunction, Keep the doors of thy mouth from her who sleepeth in thy bosom. Wherefore, we ought to pray often, but briefly, lest, if we are long about it, our crafty foe may succeed in implanting something in our heart. For that is the true sacrifice, as the sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. This is the solitary offering. These are pure drink offerings. That is the sacrifice of righteousness. The sacrifice of praise. These are true and fat victims. Holocausts full of marrow, which are offered by contrite and humble hearts, and which those who practice this control and fervor of spirit, of which we have spoken, with effectual power can sing. Let my prayer be set forth in thy sight as incense. Let the lifting up of my hands be an evening sacrifice. But the approach of the right hour and of night warns us that we ought with fitting devotion to do this very thing of which, as our slender ability allowed, we seem to have propounded a great deal and to have prolonged our conference considerably. Though we believe that we have discoursed very little, when the magnificence and difficulty of the subject are taken into account. With these words of the holy Isaac, we were dazzled rather than satisfied, and after evening service had been held, rested our limbs for a short time, and intending at the first dawn again to return under promise of a fuller discussion, departed, rejoicing over the acquisition of these precepts, as well as over the assurance of his promises. Since we felt that, 
though the excellence of prayer had been shown to us, still we had not yet understood from his discourse its nature, and the power by which continuance in it might be gained and kept.